All right, welcome everyone. My name is Carl Baldwin. I've been working on Neutron for about two years. And um, I play with basically everything L3 in Neutron. And so uh, I noticed this IPv6 work being done, not by me, but uh, by other very talented engineers in the community. And I just couldn't ignore it anymore, so um, Despite. started. Despite your best efforts. <laughs> right, despite my best efforts. Um, and so I started thinking about, well, what, what's, what, what does IPv6 mean? We, can't, we, we can take it seriously now in, op in OpenStack. Um, so I've been thinking about it over, over Kilo and, and what we're going to do for Liberty. And uh, so we got together and, and started brainstorming. And, um, this is kind of what we've, this talk is, is about kind of what we've come up with. Um, over the Kilo release, if, uh, I gave a talk here yesterday about the refactoring that, that we've done in the L3 agent. And some of that that I didn't talk about yesterday actually supports, um, supports IPv6 in Neutron. And I'm going to turn it over to Sean to talk about uh, the refactoring that was done specifically for IPv6. So during the last uh, development cycle, um, I'd like to go through some of these slides and discuss some of the work that was done by others in the community. Um, if you're actually in the crowd and you did some of the work, uh, why don't you go ahead and stand up and uh, get recognized by some of your peers? So if Dane or Sridhar, is anybody in the room? Okay. Um, so I'm briefly just going to go through some of the things that they worked on that actually accomplished all of the work um, during this release cycle. So Dane, for example, did a change for the Layer 3 agent uh, in the internal data structures so that the routers would be able to support uh, multiple IP addresses on them, the typical use case being uh, an IPv4 address and then also an IPv6 uh, prefix or an IPv6 address. Um, it's a real, it was a really difficult change um, to, to get in because it was really deep in the guts of it, and I th it was really a great piece of work um, that really allowed everything else to happen throughout the cycle. Um, so Sridhar did a lot of work on supporting IPv6 in highly available routers um, with the links to that. And then uh, we also had, a, I believe, a new contributor um, Andrew Boyk, who did a lot of fixes for Neutron. Um, and some really important changes near the end of the cycle, um, actually going over into the Nova code base and fixing some inconsistencies in the API and some of the behaviors that were actually um, causing issues at the gate. Um, and those were really critical fixes as well. So. Um, thank you to everybody who's done uh, this work. Um, really, the only piece that I was responsible for was at the end was enabling at the gate, which is used to test all of the patches that people propose to OpenStack, is to enable all of the um, infrastructure to use IPv6 for the networks that are built up and tested so that we can get closer to the ideal of testing parity between IPv4 and IPv6. Um, so what had happened is, is I had proposed this patch, and it had actually triggered all of the bugs that um, the fine folks in the audience um, in these previous slides went and actually fixed. It was a very difficult chicken and egg problem where we wanted to test at the gate, but we had to fix existing bugs in the code in order to get this to actually work. Um, so it was, it was really exciting work to work with everybody, and I thank you again. I think it's still you. Okay. So yeah. what the big thing that's coming in this next release cycle is I believe the next step is to enable dual stack on the control plane, meaning that all of the services that currently comprise the OpenStack cluster, such as the identities, the, ne the networking service, everything else, it should also have an IPv6 address that it's listening on so that we can just ensure that for the most part, all of the components, such as MySQL or whatever your database of choice is, can also be ready for the future of perhaps 
just an IPv6 only control plane so that you can free up some of your IPv4 addresses to be used for your tenants or just to sort of stave off the IPv4 exhaustion just a little while longer. Okay, and um, as I was, so I, I tried to review as many of, of the patches that, that he linked to as I could fit in. And I was reviewing them, um, all great work. Now we've got IPv6 working on networks and we've got, we've got it working with the routers. Um, I started thinking about, well, what is, what is routing out to the external world look like in, with IPv6? And I, I started picturing it in my mind and uh, I wanted to go over, well, why does, why does routing work with IPv4 in, in OpenStack to the, to the external world? Well, we, we use floating IPs and we use NAT, two things that are, that are not spoken a lot about in IPv6, if you, if you haven't noticed. Um, the, the floating IP NAT kind of creates a barrier between the public and the private address spaces. And we, we just, we always use NAT, right? And you can, you can pick your own addresses. Um, with IPv4, you kind of have to because it's, it's all full. Um, and you've, you've got to bring some private addresses, use them on internal networks, um, completely isolated from everybody else. And, and then you've got to use NAT to get, to, to get in and out. So you bring your own address, that's BYOA. So what do we do with IPv6? Well, we, we don't have NAT, we don't have floating IPs, and we'll talk about those more later. Um, our option right now is essentially to, uh, to put IP, IPv6 on a flat provider network. It works, it may fit, it may fit your needs, uh, but it doesn't allow you to use um, Neutron's richer L3 routing capabilities uh, to create networks and, and do routing in between them. So what do we do? Um, how do we move to an IPv6 routed model? Um, the, the, the diagram looks essentially like the IPv4 one, except uh, now we've got, um, we've got some external addresses and, and uh, we've got some internal addresses. And if you take Kilo right now and, and you go create an IPv6 network, um, you're, you're asked for your addresses. Well, what, where do you get the addresses from? Uh, so you, you, might, you might find some, uh, some ULA addresses in there, and you might find some, some addresses that look like they're, they're public addresses. Uh, they, they look like, you know, 2601.413 slash 64, that looks like it might be it might be routable to the, to the outside world. Um, but the thing is, is we let the user type that in. How do we know where that came from? How do we know we can route it? Um, most likely we can't, actually. So um, how do we know if an address is routable? Well, in, in, this, in this context, it's not really a function of the address. It's, it's a function of the context. It's, it's, um, it's, it's what you're actually able to route, route to the external world and back. In fact, a, a ULA in a certain context may be routable. Um, and a global may not be. So today in Neutron, the, the Neutron routers route everything. Um, if, if it doesn't know it belongs to an internal, an internal network, it, it routes it up to the external world. Um, so the trick is knowing what's going to come back. Um, how do we know if it routes back if, if the return path comes back to us? And, and then how do we get it into that internal network? Well, we need to somehow set up the Neutron router as the next hop for, that, for the router, um, the, the northbound router. So how do we do that? And I came up with a few thoughts 
Um, and a couple of them we're actually working on for Liberty. Uh, prefix delegation was pretty close for Kilo, um, but it didn't quite make it, and it, I expect it'll be ready for, for Liberty. Uh, dynamic routing is another option. Um, if we can get Neutron to speak a routing protocol to the external world and give it some hints, hey, this is how you get back to me. Uh, this, this internal network, oh, that's, that's behind that router right there. That's your next hop. Um, there's a couple other. These, these are the ones with question marks. Proxy neighbor discovery. Um, do, we, do we create a neutron router with static routes? Um, those are all possibilities. Um, but even if we do that, um, bring, your own, bring your own address still doesn't work. Um, typically, you, you can't just route anything back that you want to. You, you're given a prefix of addresses that, that, come to your, that come in to your world from the external world. And so how do we solve that? Oh, actually, um, this is just a little addition. So, so but, to that point, yeah. at least on the IPv6 side, we have a way, rather than the typical workflow on the IPv4 side with Neutron is, you talk to your network administrator who gives you a IPv4 sitter, and then you actually, with the Neutron command line client, will feed that address in with the uh, subnet create command and associate it with a network. With the prefix delegation protocol in IPv6, instead what we can do is have Neutron fill out some of this information that we were requiring users of the API to provide to Neutron itself. So, for example, we can have Neutron request from external systems prefixes that will then be routed into the Neutron uh, network. And from a user side of things, if you aren't a network person to begin with, the networking API can have a lot of complexity to it when a lot of people may just be like, I want to have a connection to the internet and people can connect into me. And prefix delegation work it would be one of those mechanisms that would realize that. Right, so um, I think I already covered dynamic routing. Uh, dynamic routing is, is, is not a mechanism for, uh, obviously for for doling out addresses, but it, it's a mechanism for um, getting the next hop back to the back to the OpenStack Neutron router. Are these out of order? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is where I want to be. Sure. Okay, so so how do we handle the be, the bring your own address problem? We talked we talked about prefix delegation. That's one possible solution to that, we actually, um, prefix delegation gives the problem to an external system. Um, so when, when you create your subnet, instead of typing in your subnet details, what you do is you give a keyword that says, uh, just, just get it from prefix delegation. And um, after some time, that will, be f that will be filled in for you by the external system, and you'll be able to see what it is with a, with a Neutron subnet show. Another, another possible solution to this is to use a, a new feature that, that landed in, in Kilo called subnet allocation. Subnet allocation is a way in Neutron to define an address pool um, and allow Neutron to manage that for you. Um, I saw uh, Kyle and Mark do a presentation yesterday where they had a nice graphic for this. I wish I had it. Um, it shows you, you create a pool, let's say, for example, you get a slash 56 uh, that's yours, and you want, you want to give that out to, to your tenants. Well, as they, as they create subnets, instead of giving the subnet details like we're used to with subnet create, we, uh, we instead pass the, the UUID of subnet pool. And optionally, we, we pass the size of the subnet we want. 
With IPv6, it's, it's pretty much always a slash 64 that you want. There's really no reason to want anything bigger or smaller than that. Uh, so that can be left off. So subnet create with this subnet pool, it will, it will assign you your prefix for your subnet. And I wanted to mention that uh, Ryan Tidwell and Zangfa Gao did a lot of work on implementing this and got it landed in Kilo. And they really deserve a lot of credit for getting that in there. So th this is what it looks like. Um, we, we currently only have Neutron command line support for it. Um, but we've got a Neutron subnet create. And I, I highlighted the important parts in red. You'll, you'll notice there's no subnet details on the command line. There's just a dash dash subnet pool. Uh, I use demo subnet pool as the name. Prefix length. And it, and it creates it with, with something allocated from from the pool. And also the subnet pool, go, just going back to this slide, the subnet pool ID is recorded with the subnet. Um, and that becomes important a bit later. Uh, this shows that, th this was me playing around with DevStack. I actually, I didn't want to do a live demo because uh, I thought that would take too, time, too much time and I, I was sure it would crash and burn. But. Um, I was playing with DevStack, and I, um, you know, I created this subnet pool, and I, I allocated stuff to it, and, and I, I found that this was what I had to do to get my VMs on two different networks to talk to each other. And this is, this is basically just an IP route add to BRX. And this, this shows that there, there really is a hole right here, and the hole is getting, the route, getting things routed back into an internal network. And once I did that, once I did this, I was able to do this. Um, I, I SSH to, I've got VM1 hi highlighted here. VM1's on, on one network. And from VM, VM1, I SSH to VM2, which is on a completely different network. And just by adding those, those routes with the next hop to the Neutron router, I was able to complete that, that circuit. So uh, the subnet pool is recorded with, with the subnet. And this, um, this is getting in, th this is addressing the problem where right now we just route everything everywhere. Um, how do we know the difference between a subnet that, that someone typed in at the command line and one that was obtained from, from a pool that, was, um, that we can actually route. And um, the answer is something that I'm looking to, to do in Liberty called address scopes. Um, we take these, these subnet pools and we group them into address scopes. And then what we do with address scopes is we can tell the neutron routers to honor them, to not route between address scopes. And in the future, we can also, um, we can also use this to integrate with something like a BGP or an L3 VPN. Um, they use concepts like this uh, to, to isolate L3 traffic between, um, between data centers and between clouds. And so the end goal for all of this is, is to allow the user to just say, I really don't care what addresses I have. Just, just give me an internet subnet and route it for me. And that, that's the end goal of this. So here is the part where I give out a little bit of bad news. Floating IPs is not currently on the roadmap for functionality between the IPv4 side of Neutron and the IPv6 side of Neutron. And I wanted to sort of give everybody a couple 
reasons why I believe this is, and a little bit of history to it so that you all don't hunt me down and, and burn me at the stake um, afterwards. So when I was at the QA Summit, I had a really great conversation with uh, Sean Digg and Dean Troyer. And we sort of just got into a, a discussion about networking, and Dean told us about how they had done Nova Network when they uh, were at NASA. So floating IPs is sort of an overloaded term that has two different concepts put together. Um, it, part of it is the elastic IP model from a Amazon Web Services, the idea that you can quickly re-IP instances without any sort of interruption from the client side. Um, usually when you create an instance, you get a routable IPv4 address, and then you can use the elastic IP functionality to apply that elastic IP uh, over top. So what happened is that the original Nova install had a slash 26 for the entire cluster. So IPv4 addresses that are exter the external IPv4 addresses were an extremely scarce resource, especially for this computing environment where they were running simulations and stuff like that. They couldn't just give out that all those addresses to every compute instance that was going to come up. Oops. So we go into the part of having the external inbound access and then the fault tolerance concepts. They've now been currently mixed on the v4 side because there's a lot of use cases where if you have a node go down, you would want to use an elastic, I'm sorry, a floating IP to reassign it to a node that is live. Um, and that would be one of the use cases that people are tempted to do on the v6 side, especially with um, Slack types of subnet allocations um, because the address is going to be based on the MAC address and unless you're preserving your ports in between destructions of your instances, um, floating IPs would be your, your quick thing that you would want to reach for to preserve that same sort of um, parity between the v4 side and the v6 side. But IPv6 addresses are not a scarce resource. And we need to split out the two separate pieces of what a floating IP is. The external IP address and external connectivity we solve by just giving you a globally routable IP address. And then it's in my mind, if we want to talk about fault tolerance and other types of conveniences, there are other techniques that we can use um, besides just creating a NAT where you know, the, the traffic for that floating IP address is intercepted and then rewritten and then given to the instance, um, perhaps through load balancing, any cast. You know, there's plenty of work that's been done in trying to solve this problem. Um, and at this point, I believe it could be an advanced service. It doesn't need to live within the Neutron code base it, itself. Uh, just due to some of the complexity of the floating IP code, um, and some of the bugs that have uh, been exposed and then the fixes to them, uh, it's been very difficult. Now, this is just my opinion. Um, I think that if you come to me with a valid use case as to why you would need this, um, it could, I could change my mind on it. Um, it's really, the IPv6 um, sub, sub team was driven by people in the community who said, I need the following functionality, here's why, and we forged a path forward. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't top down in any sort of way. So there's always the case that there really is some sort of use case that this is the only way they could have that happen. Um, but I think for the most part, just the two concepts of fault tolerance and then external con connectivity, we are at a place where we can s separate those concepts out and it doesn't need to be done the way it was done on the V4 side. And I think at that point, we're at the end of our slides, so. Okay. Um, so we do have microphones up in the aisle, so if you do have a question, please line up. At least one, yeah. Um, also, this is a presentation thing, so be a little gentle if you have really intricate technical questions. I usually so, try and defer them till afterward. Yeah, Prakash here from FutureWise. Simple question. Uh, 
especially because IPv6 we have a suppose we have a slash 64 and I have a slash 56 and slash 48 let's say okay and uh, since the outgoing routing is always slash 64 um, if you mentioned like if you get through DA VD that is uh, either it is allocated or obtained from external sources the IP now if the best practices says that allocation should be done by location or by usage within that 16 bits of subnets. Will it impact anything in routing in L3 if they are at distributed locations? So, suppose I have building one, building two, I am trying to have some 48s based on locations and some based on usage. So, how will it impact? Okay. Or will it impact or no impact for routing, especially at L3? So um, I think initially, if, if, if your neutron deployment spans building one, building two, uh, then there will, there will be really no distinction between the two. Um, if, if you have a deployment in building one and a different deployment in building two, um, then then you would split that off, split that the way that you want them allocated by location. Does, did so, I understand the question? Correctly? So is that, does that mean that still the preference will be based on location as a best practice? We should first, uh, in the prefix, uh, after the 48, when I come to another 16, the first eight I should allocate to location so that it, it is location aware. I think this is, this is sort of a, question that may be best taken offline. Okay, thank you. Be, yeah. there, there could be some, some thing, you could create multiple pools um, you, with the different prefixes that you have. Um, and maybe lo further in the future, there'll, there'll be more integrated support for this, but yeah. Hi, this is Jonas Hohen with Nokia. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I actually wanted to comment on that you left out uh, the floating IPs, and I think that you guys did exactly the right thing. I'm like looking at what you, <laughs> looking at what you want, and not looking at how you did it in V4 is the right thing to do here. And basically, you have other options in V6 that you don't have in V4. You have things like prefix delegation, which you didn't have in four use those. The other thing is also that you can renumber networks m more easily. There is help in V6 for that. Use those techniques to deal with those things that, that uh, when you really have to renumber. So I think you guys did the right thing. Just to kind of like, I'm not sure I understood your complete problem with the uh, dynamic um, routing and stuff like that, but there's work going on in the IETF called HomeNet which is not necessarily directly relevant to this, but could have mm -hmm. some hints on what we could do here, is how to do kind of like um, non-managed networks that are routable, that do have multiple subnets and so on, that use automatic tools to do that. And we might want to take a look at some of that work, if it's applicable at all or not, uh, to OpenStack as well. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting, uh, that's a very interesting yeah. suggestion. I, I definitely will follow up on that and, to, and read in more. Thank you. I'm happy to help. Thank you. That would be great. Thank you. So the prefixes that you want to delegate have to come from somewhere. Yes. <laughs> you didn't really right. talk about that. Instead of anything like static configure, are you thinking APIs to interface with an IPAM or? So... I'm going to try and summarize work that was done by other people who are far more intelligent than me on it. But yes, there is still the problem of whatever. So for example, for prefix delegation, there is still somewhere somebody is making a decision about what pool it is going to be delegated from. Um, so the easiest one to say is, is that my residential internet service provider has a big prefix that they delegate out to their actual customers in their houses. So yes, I don't, there is still that problem, I guess. Right, and with, um, with subnet pools, we've moved that problem from, from the individual tenant 
where they, they have to get that out of band and type it in. Um, we've moved that to a subnet pool, which is still in the reference implementation, is, it's still manually entered, but it's, it's entered by an admin, right. and it's entered at, at, a, at a larger level. There's a larger subnet from which you can carve um, so there, smaller subnets. So there's some enterprise best practices, as much as you can call anything a best practice on something that we haven't really done very well yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I would encourage you to look at some of the best practices for non-cloud data centers and think how that would fit in. Right. I think we've tried to right. punt in some cases with the external IPAM work that you've had is that perhaps right. people who are deploying Neutron, they've already decided for their organization how they're going to do IP allocation and Neutron can just punt to that system that's already been set up. Right. APIs, we, we know how good that is. Give us the APIs back and forth so right. we can set them. Well, on the prefix delegation side, we're just using the, the, the PD protocol itself and uh, the Dibbler client. So in some cases, it's not really an API. It's the, pro the lower level protocol itself. Right, in the case of prefix delegation, we, we push that completely to the external system. Uh, there's also work being done for Liberty uh, called pluggable IPAM. And we'll, um, I'll be talking about that with, uh, with two, two guys from uh, Infoblox tomorrow. And with pluggable IPAM, we can delegate IPAM to an external system as long as we have a driver for that external system. Right, API. Um, yeah. James Cave, Fortinet. Um, one of the things about IPv6 is their the address, is you showed it on your screen, they're fairly unwieldy, um, especially when you're starting to do a delegation. I uh, mm -hmm. just thought, Right. And, and this kind of dovetails with the IPAM discussion as well. Um, have you thought about maybe having PTR record insertion uh, at the same time for some of those zones um, to automatically give you some, some, some ease of use for those particular users? So, I mean, you create your delegate, top end delegation, it creates a zone automatically because you'll give it a name and then all of a sudden you'll have sub delegation, the, the actual delegated networks actually automatically create, you know, their individual zones as well and so forth and so on. So. Actually, yes. Um, I, I actually wrote a blueprint also on, on integrating with external DNS systems and tying a, a zone with, uh, with a neutron network so that both, both the A, 4A, and, and PTR records are managed automatically. Right. Um, so, if, so, for example, integrating with Designate or another type right. of system so that we have that, those things are also done for you as well. And right. thank you. That's, we're using one of the, the designate sessions on Thursday. I think it's at 1.30, but I, I can't promise that. And we're going to talk about that um, between Nova, Neutron, and, and designate. We're going to talk about doing that. Yeah, that, that's one of the problems with the adoption of the protocol itself is just people look at those addresses and they're like, nope. Right. <laughs> I, I even simplified it. I tried to simplify them as much as possible for the slides. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Can you talk a little bit about uh, where the status is with accessing the meta, uh, metadata service via IPv6? Um, there was a great uh, Twitter conversation that I had with, um, I'm totally blanking on the name, but I've maintained the, the position that the metadata API comes from Amazon, and we can't really make changes to the Amazon API because when they do IPv6 in their cloud, I'm sure they're probably going to address that issue of how does a instance access a metadata API on the v6 side. And I think a problem for us would be is if we try and anticipate what they're going to do, do it, and then they end up doing something different. But it sh they should do a well-defined address. So there, there was part of the Twitter conversation where uh, the person who said that indicated that they don't like that idea. Um, and I think they do have a point where it should be a well-established IPv4 address. But yes, that would, be, that would be one way to solve that. You're not going to break anything because that's already not a globally routed right. Right, but I think there is still people that want, that agree with that, but then there's also people who disagree. And, I'm trying to see if maybe Amazon will make the decision for me so that it's... 
Right. Well, my cop out for that is as well, just use config drive because that's really the way that we should be doing it, I think. But yes, it's a difficult problem. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hey, Sean. Hey. Uh, good to see you, and uh, thank you, and also the IPv6 sub team for the great contribution. Uh, I just want to uh, clarify a couple of things. Uh, since you mentioned both the previous delegation, also the subnet pool, right? Um, for the previous delegation, um, I just want to understand what the really uh, challenge here. Is it because we have to communicate with both Neutron system and also the upstream router to make previous delegation work? Is that the main challenge for guys to kind of uh, slow down a little bit or, or anything else? Uh, I think uh, second, my second question, I think you may already answer that. I assume there is no, at least at this moment, there is no uh, API for the user to provision any previous litigation through the, uh, via the Neutron system. Is, is that right? Uh, so those, those patches are still in flight, but um, my thinking on it is, is that prefix delegation should just be a type of mechanism that is done on the Neutron back end to actually accomplish all this, to make the API as general as possible to maybe have something where it's like, just give me an internet address, where you right. don't have to <clears throat> have more Neutron commands to learn just to do uh, on the side. But I see. there's a lot of big pieces to this, um, and I'm also not the one writing it, so I don't want to uh, speak to something that I don't quite know as well, but it's it's definitely something that we, we're going to have to work on. Sure. Right. So, so in, in summary, I believe the, the general trend is you want to keep the API at least the, the, also together with the CLI syntax as, as static as, as possible. And but in the back end, everything is actually had no yeah. in the back end. Right. Uh, the, way, the way we looked at doing that for pre prefix delegation is to handle it like a subnet pool. I see. Uh, so. The only API change is is already been done. It's it's dash dash subnet pool, and then there's a um, e, you'll put in either PD or prefix delegation. He he said the patch is still in flight. The decision hasn't been made, but there will be a special string for um, I want a prefix delegated address. Sure. And um, and coming back to the to, uh, subnet pool, since you you gave us the example on the screen, is that something already available or uh, another thing I want to understand is uh, what the main difference between the subnet pool and the previous delegation approach. And in addition, for the subnet pool, can subnet pool really work in the provider network model, or have to tie with uh, the layer three agent? <laughs> That's some good questions. Um, okay, uh, the first question I heard was, "What's the main difference between prefix delegation and subnet pools?" Yes. Um, the way I see it. Prefix delegation pushes everything to an external system, which may be exactly what you want. Okay. Um, subnet pools give Neutron control over, over a certain piece of, of the address space, a, a, a part of it that we call a pool. And Neutron will allocate with its internal IPAM implementation will allocate those addresses from, from subnet pool. So I think there's only a minute left if we want to. I, I know there's at least one gentleman who has a question. Sure. Maybe we can I, give him a chance. Thank you. So uh, this is uh, Deng Hui from China Mobile. So I, I would like to comment previous comments about the differences between home networking and uh, cloud. I think that's a, that's a very big difference. Is they don't have load balance. So that would be different. Uh, we have to solve this problem for IPv6. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I agree. I think that's it. All right. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, everyone. everyone.